Hey Axis and Allies players, the good captain here. Welcome to a review of Russia's round two and Germany's round two in this game of Axis and Allies 1914 played against a human opponent. Uh, so we're just starting from the top of the Russian turn. Five infantry and Artie and a fighter are purchased. And the combat move, uh, the Russian battleship enters the sea zone east of London, England, whatever, both. And uh, every piece that could go into the attack went into the attack, including the fighter. So there's two separate battles here. Battle for air superiority, which is, uh, you know, whoever gets that gets a, with, with, the, with this amount of artillery on either side, it's 12 for the Russian and 8 doesn't really matter. You just add them up. It's tw it's 20 pieces of artillery. So that's just a there's a lot on the table there. You can have battles with very few barrels and the air superiority means much much less, but this is uh, a lot rides on who wins the air battle. So, um, out of the gate the Russians miss with a sixth and out of the gate the Austrians hit on a two. So that's that's that. So let's go ahead and take a look now at this rather critical battle without uh, Russian air supremacy because it's still quite potent. Um, by the way, I wonder if anybody knows what a 2 at 2. Uh, you know, 1, 2 at 2. This is a fairly common G40 thing that can happen. Like sub attacking a destroyer. Uh, Popular move in G40, insofar as I have seen, is to take a, a German sub and attack the British transport east of Canada. That's a two at two battle. Do you know what that is? I know it. It's a 40 20 40. So 40% 40 chance attacker wins, 40% chance defender wins. That 20% is that the sub and the destroyer kill each other. And that is the same for this battle. In other words, it's more likely than not that your piece is going down, right? Because uh, the enemy winning and the draw together are 60%. So most of the time, your plane is going down in this in this fight. But it just so happened the Austrians ended up being, uh, you know, better than even. So okay, uh, what do we have here? 29, 8, 6, and 1. Or sorry, 29, 8, and 1. And uh, we rack this up to 2K. This thing, if you don't do it, will lie to you. So, um, I think this comes out in favor of the Austrians uh, slightly. Yeah. So now it's it, this is basically a dead even fight. That negative one, negative a half a piece for the Russians. So, eh. so the math for the Russians when we add up all their pieces and divide by six, this this will doing that just shows you the center line of the bell curve is 19.66667. So the Russians the most reasonable outcome is you know not, not more likely 20 pieces than 19 but somewhere around there. And the Russians roll 12 hits. Again, the expectation was 19 uh, probably 20. So this is almost negative eight hits. This is about as bad as it could be for the Russians. And the Austrians are expecting to get uh, 20 hits and you know every now and then they might expect a 21st hit, right? But so anyway, uh, that's that's the, the other side of the coin and uh, whoops, where are we? <laughs> Here we are. And uh, not only did we catch that 21st kill, but two more. So we almost, the, the Austrians scored nearly plus three, while the Russians scored nearly minus eight. So, yeah, that's a, that is a rough, that's a very rough battle. That just plain sucks. <clears throat> I, I, and honestly, I would, you know that that just as well could have gone the other way. Uh, you know, 
the Austrians could be the ones with their an army blown out from under them. But it's, it's not a battle I wanted to fight. It's a one that I felt like I had to. That, that move into Poland is basically, I feel like, a forces the CP's hand. It's an aggressive push to automatically delay the Germans by a turn and to, to have the Austrians also delay a turn entering Russia is borderline unacceptable. So, uh, yeah, I mean, you have to, I, I feel like you have to, as the Austrian player in that position, you have to, you have to just push all your chips into the center of the table and say all in, and, and then let the other guy, you know, decide what to do or not to do. And, and in that position, the Russian player, you, 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 you feel this overwhelming desire or need to attack because now there's a large army adjacent to Moscow. So this, this is worse than, I mean, I've done this a few times. I've had it done to me a few times. That's pretty bad. But for me, in my experience as the Russian player, when an opponent did this, you know, it was a, you know, to me, bad enough that I, that's basically why I don't even want to, I don't want to play dice anymore uh, with, with the Russians like that. So, yeah, but still, that sucks. Uh, you know, the veteran did, does not, did not, did not deserve that. That's that was nasty, uh, but the game's still young. The Entente can can take a you know a couple one or more than one of those. I'd say the Entente can take absorb about two of those catastrophic losses and still uh, carry on. The, the CP really can't. They could probably take maybe one like that, uh, maybe one and a half if you're if you're really good and lucky elsewhere. So. There's definitely, you know, there's still going to be a ton of game left. Um, anyway, let's move on. Uh, the Germans, I've elected to purchase two fighters this time, and nine infantry will save two. Uh, the first thing I want to do is Africa, because I always forget Africa. And after much deliberation, I've decided to seize the Union of South Africa from Southwest Africa and move these two infantries into Rhodesia. And, uh, you know, I think this is a good good counterplay by the British. Um, yeah, of course, I, I thought about, you know, this move here. Um, but my... My MO with the Germans down here is to survive as long as possible and mobility kill the British as long as possible. And by that I mean, if I'm going to die, I want to die down here at the bottom of the continent to, uh, you know, just pull Br Br people down as far as, as fast as we can. And engaging in combat in Angola, like, yeah, I want to do that. I do as the German player, but... It accelerates the, you know, it accelerates the attrition of your own forces, and I, I just, I would rather have the British do that on their turn. I don't want to help them do that on my turn. Even though, yes, of course, you know, the prospect of hot dice would really change things. I'll take the bird in the hand, insofar as I am able. Um, and I say that fully understanding the Entente advantage in transports. Okay, now. Uh, Next moves are mostly pretty intuitive. We ram into Poland. Finally get going there. Uh, on the west front, leave a blocker in Belgium. Stack all sauce. <coughs> uh, not not Uvic though. Uh, you come here. You'll stack here. Uh, I decided to send an artillery and infantry into Munich. These three artilleries to Silesia. This fighter to Silesia. Infantry to Ruhr from Kiel. And then what the Berlin split. How are we going to split this? Uh, I decided to go four south and five east. Yeah, four south and five east. Gotta fight the two front war. You gotta do it. Uh, I think.
think that's a, one of the signs of an experienced CP player is understanding what to send where. And for the people who like the historical accuracy nonsense with regards to Axis and Allies, you know, that that's what Germany had to do. So, okay, uh, enough of that. The fighters are going to stay in Silesia. This is actually an interesting point. They, they, they stay here. It serves a zero purpose to put them in Poland. It only reduces their effectiveness on the board. From Silesia, they have access to Ruhr, Munich, and Tyrolia, whereas the intuitive move would be to push Poland. But there's no reason to do that. Uh, there's no infantry in Livonia or Belarus for the Russians, and even if the, anyway, you, you can extrapolate that. I'm not going to talking too much. Let's move on. Uh, the, the the Russian battleship. Uh, that's interesting. So this is going to repair if we don't kill it now. So I like that move. <laughs> I like that. Uh, why do I like that? Um, because it puts you to a decision. It puts the CP player to a decision. Uh, this is essentially, he didn't attack, right? He, he's making me do it, which it reduces, because he didn't attack on his turn, it makes it so that if I want to kill it, that's my move, right? That's my move for at least one boat, but that would be crazy just to use one boat. So he has absorbed, I can take the battleship, but he'll still do the same amount of damage or still has the same probability of doing the same amount of damage than if he had attacked on his turn. But in exchange, in exchange for waiting, he freezes up one or more of my units. So yeah, same result, but better effect. So well done. Uh, let's see, moving on. I think that's the only fight I have. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's drop some dice. Yes, attack. He's dead, and yeah, we give him the sub. Okay. Yes, two British cruisers in range. Okay, blah, blah, blah. All right, Germany. Place. And yeah, I think that's it. <clears throat> and yeah, that was one other thing I liked about the Africa move, uh, is that it boosted my IPCs to 45. I Numbers divisible by three are always the most flexible in Axis and Allies 1914 as regards purchases, since the only unit that isn't purchasable with a number divisible by three is artillery. So this essentially means if you have any, if you have a number that's not divisible by three and you're one of those folks that likes to spend every single IPC on their turn, you are going to have to buy artillery. It's the only way to get rid of all your money. <laughs> Everything else uh, is a number divisible by three, so it sort of locks you up. Anyway, okay, thanks for watching this. All the best from the good captain, and bye-bye.